Good evening. My name is Savannah Tibbetts, and as the Vice President of Praxis, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Mr. Gregory Remke. Mr. Remke is currently the Program Director for Economic Thinking, a Seattle-based educational foundation, and he holds a degree in economics from the University of Washington. He has worked with the Reason Foundation, the Institute for Humane Studies, uh, the Center for the American Idea, and the Foundation for Economic Education. In addition to directing a variety of educational programs, Mr. Remke has published articles for The Freeman, Reason, GlobalEnvision.org, and much more. He is also the co-author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Global Economics. <laughs> Furthermore, Mr. Remke's economic insight has been published in resource books, study guides, and newsletters focused on debate topics for high school students. Today, Mr. Remke will be talking about charter cities, both ancient and modern, and their contribution to economic development. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest tonight, Mr. Gregory Remke. Okay, well, as uh, so often happens, we've had minor technical difficulties. So my screen is like bigger than the, uh, because my topic is bigger than the screen can possibly handle. <laughs> it's a little bit larger than it would be. So I do workshops for high school and homeschool speech and debate students, and I do workshops in Europe for the Economic uh, Institute for Economic Studies Europe. And I've been, we had a debate topic on US-Russia policy a couple years ago, and I got involved in researching the history of Russia and started reading about uh, uh, Novgorod. Um, which is a city not too far from Moscow that was part of the Hanseatic League. And so it had entirely different institutions than Moscow did. And the, the, of the books I read on this, the argument that it, Novgorod got destroyed, but had it not been destroyed, Russia would have had different institutions in its uh, development over the, over the centuries. Novgorod was a place you know, run by businessmen, a trading city. Uh, they hired aristocrats to defend the city, and if they didn't like what they were doing, they'd fire them. You know, they hired an army, fired an army. Apparently, it wasn't good enough to keep out the army that destroyed Novgorod, so maybe there were some problems with the theory. But in any case, I got to know about Hanseatic League and cities and the role of cities in Western economic development, and particularly Richard Pipe's book, uh, Property and Freedom, on the importance of institutions, property institutions, and economics development. So with that as a uh, foreword, uh, Lots of books to recommend. I'm going to be talking about some of the ideas in Rival City and in Borderless Economics, two terrific books, as if you don't have enough books to read as students this in Hillsdale, but two terrific books on, uh, on economic development. My background was in economic history at the University of Washington. Uh, I was a student of Doug North there on institutions and Western economic history. And I've always been fascinated with that. The study of economic history is really the same study as development economics, right? So if you have a sense of what led countries in Europe to develop and prosper over the centuries, that gives you insight over what institutions might help countries in Africa or Latin America or Asia to develop. So there's a similarity in the study of institutions and prosperity uh, in those two subjects. So uh, I'm gonna try and talk here about exchange cities, arrival cities, and charter cities. Exchange cities, I'm going to just briefly mention to Stu to Tracy and his view that uh, cities are a society as a system of exchanges. Arrival cities, I'm going to be drawing from a book by Doug Saunders that is about the migrations. The migrations around the world in the last couple decades are the largest in human history. Millions and millions of people are migrating to cities in Africa, Latin America, Asia. We <coughs> see this presented in the news as a problem. Right? In China, they've got the problem of the tens, or hundreds, lots of millions of people migrating to the cities illegally because they can't get a permit, and the Chinese government has to deal with all these people in the cities. Or in Africa, in Nairobi, in Lagos, just millions of people migrating and living in shanty towns. But it's presented as the migration to the cities are the problem. But I would argue migration to the cities are the solution. Right? This is what's happened throughout Western Europe and America since, you know, 1700s, 1800s, we had this large-scale migration to our cities as farm productivity went up. You didn't need as many people on a farm. If you watch The Wizard of Oz, you know, The Wizard of Oz, there's all those farm hands helping out with stuff. You know, so eventually those guys, as mechanization comes, 
Uh, more of those farmhands move to the city. Of course, population grows. Okay, so it's an amazing story. It's not in the news much, but there's been a series of books about the city, Edward Glasner, a Glazer, and this Doug Saunders book, and I'll talk about those. And then I'm going to go into charter cities. So the argument for economic development uh, comes from a Paul Romer at Stanford and others who are arguing that if we want to promote development rapidly, a charter city is a way to do it. That is setting up a Hong Kong or a Singapore, a mini uh, area with its own legal institutions that can jumpstart economic growth. Okay, so with that said, we'll start ahead and see how much fits on. I was at a conference at the Philadelphia Society in Indianapolis over the weekend, and the topic was on social justice, uh, poverty and inequality <coughs> in the U.S., and this is a big subject in the universities, and I'm happy not to be dealing with it. Uh, one of the neat things about dealing, work, looking at Africa, Latin America, Asia, is you don't have to focus on social justice issues in the U.S. When you talk about poverty in Africa, people are really, really poor, or in India, or in China, the kind of... Uh, poverty that everyday people deal with is astonishing, but it, I think it gives, it in, gives us insight. I'm going to argue that the same cause of, or the same institutional problems that are preventing economic development around the world are what's hurting people in the inner cities here in America. It's the same sort of, same sort of category of problem. So I'm going to be talking about, I wanted to narrow my topic, so I'm just going to be talking about Africa, India, China, and Latin America. On, <laughs> These after, and, then, uh, and then talk about Arab Spring and the revolutions in North Africa and the Middle East. So, I, you know, pretty constrained, okay. <laughs> well, let's see if that works. Uh, so, I'd like to play a video now. I don't have the setup for it, but you can find online, there's a video from Hernando de Soto, Globalization at the Crossroads. How many of you have read or studied some of the work of Hernando de Soto, The Economist, not The Conquistador? <laughs> so, so Hernando de Soto is writing on the role of property institutions in Latin America and other countries, basically arguing that in much of Latin America, people lack access to legal institutions. So if someone wants to build a house, you can't get title to the property, or people that are in business, most are illegal because they can't get a permit for their business. And he's documented this in Peru with his book, The Other Path. And then he's written a book called The Mystery of Capital, where he looks at these same legal institutions around the world. He's arguing that the world is full of entrepreneurs. Right? You can hardly get out of an airport in a third world country without having you know, 20 people come up to you wanting to do a deal. Right? Full of entrepreneurs. But they lack access to legal institutions that allow them to start companies, uh, uh, to own property. And that legal problem is an obstacle uh, now in the developing world. And uh, that's what Hernando de Soto talks about at this globalization in the, in the Crossroads video. Uh, so, that said, oh, here it is. It's only missing the sound. I can narrate it. <laughs> um, I know I just needed a cable, but it doesn't. It does. <coughs> no, it, it's not plugged in. Oh, it's not. Yeah, so, okay. it's okay. So, lots of pictures, but basically he's arguing that why is it that capitalism works in the West and other countries aren't getting prosperous? What's wrong there? So, let me going to switch from that subject, which is why there's so much poverty in Latin America and Africa, and jump right to the Middle East, to Arab Spring. And Fernando de Soto's research in Egypt, I think, is key. This was in the Wall Street Journal uh, 2011. De Soto had an article that basically documented the research they provided the Egyptian government in uh, 2004, 2004, I think it was. Basically, they studied the Egyptian economy to find out how the legal institutions worked, the same sort of thing he did in Peru. It turned out that most people didn't have access to the legal system or property rights or business tools. They couldn't borrow money, so it made hard time to run a company. So De Soto did a proposal and research to the Egyptian government saying, if you want to have economic growth, these are the sort of reforms that need to happen. So they presented this to the Egyptian government 1,000-page report, 20-point action plan to the cabinet of what to do in 2004. The Minister of Finance was enthusiastic and saying, this is great, we're going to push this. Uh, it was approved by the cabinet. The new major newspaper said this is going to open the door to Egypt, to the modern world. And that was the end of the cabinet minister, who was soon ousted. And the plan disappeared, and the whole idea disappeared. 
the argument about Arab Spring is a big part of you know, the, the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt and now still continuing in Syria is that everyday people weren't protesting that they couldn't vote necessarily. It was that they couldn't run businesses. They didn't have access to the legal system, according to DeSoto. The fellow who set himself on fire just had a, what, a vegetable cart and he kept getting harassed by the police. So the elites had the money, the elites had the permits, uh, but everyday people didn't. So the challenge is that this isn't just stupidity that has the economy this way. It is that the people that do have the permits make monopoly rents on it. They get money. They get the money from the foreign aid or the bakeries or others are owned by friends of government officials. So to summarize that, the underground economy, you know, Egypt was the biggest part. There were 6.8 million people in the private sector. Public sector, 5.9 million. That's a problem in and of itself, right? And then 9.6 million people, most people, work in companies that were illegal. That is, if the policeman said, what are you doing? The guy says, I, I'm sorry, officer, I left my permit at home or whatever, and they have to pay a bribe or they get arrested or they get their stuff confiscated. It's tough for the economy to grow when people don't have access to the legal system. 92% of Egyptians had property without a title. So in the towns all around Cairo, or millions of people who lived in houses sometimes their grand grandparents built their house, but they didn't have a title to it. So anybody who improves their house, somebody knocks at the door and says, gosh, this is my house. Here's a letter from an official who says it's mine. So in other words, people were trying to hide their wealth and be careful because you don't have property rights. So that's what DeSoto said in Egypt. In Egypt, again, the revolution comes. Another thing about Egypt, the population has been growing. Um, but Here's an example to open a bakery, 500 days to get permits. Plus, you've got to learn how to bake. I don't know how to bake. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know how to get a permit either. I can hardly get a permit from the state of Texas to sell stuff in Texas. I've been on the phone like 20 times to people from Texas who call me, ask me all sorts of questions I don't know the answers to. And if you answer the wrong thing, you're it's illegal somehow, right? So anyway, that's a distraction. Um, but, uh, OK, so you the title to a vacant piece of land, 10 years of red tape. To do business, poor entrepreneurs got to go to 56 government agencies and deal with inspections all the time. So I lay this out as a groundwork of one of the problems, similar poverty elsewhere in Africa and Egypt and the turmoil, is people don't have access to the free enterprise system because the legal system doesn't work. Now, the other aspect of the story, and we can't see the, this is the population of Cairo, 1970, there's 5 million people, 1980, nearly 7 million, 1998 million, 10 million. So there's been a huge in-migration of people plus population growth in Cairo. Uh, child mortality rates are down, uh, more people surviving. So you've got a huge influx of people to the city and not a legal system to create new businesses and new housing to handle those people. So you have these slums and problems. And this is around the developing world. So in a rival city, there's a chapter on Istanbul and so for the Islamic world, if you want a success story, what Cairo could have been, what could have prevented the Arab Spring and all this violence, you can look at Turkey. Turkey has an amazing success story, and it's a, it's a story of what Sanders calls a rival city, people migrating. So since the 1950s, there is a bus stop outside of Istanbul called Harem, and every day, buses come full of people from the far ends of Turkey from eastern Turkey, southern Turkey, from poor villages. People have come to Cairo for uh, decades. And the story sort of tells, us, tells about that process. Uh, but basically, what's happened is these 20 years of people coming, they come in to work in Cairo. They've got a chance to earn income, but there's no place to live. Housing's too expensive. So he tells the story of people. This, his story starts mainly in the 70s large in migration, people don't have a place to live. So they go to the outskirts. They found a park uh, not too far out of town in a, on a rough road. It's hard for the police to get to. And they just started building houses for the in migration. They had, so, so they had thousands of people there. And the, it's an amazing story to read about this. Basically, if the police see you building a house on land that isn't yours, they'll tear it down. So they build houses only at night. When, the, when it gets dark, they start building these houses. They, they'd have the process of going in and building the foundation and getting that all set and then covering it up so no one can see it. And they leave and go away and sleep during the day. 
Then they come back at the next dark and build the rest of the house. The police show up in the morning and there's a whole house there. You know, and the whole, pretty soon there's thousands, tens of thousands of houses in these remote village, remote areas outside of Istanbul. And some of them were run by, uh, you know, the political groups were, were communists, some were fascists, and some were Islamists. So they would fight each other and fight the government. This goes on for years. Uh, there's a major battle, hundreds of people die. There's a coup in Turkey where the new government takes over. And then things get interesting. The, uh, the new government decides to deal with these riots by order number 2805 that grants amnesty to all these people that were living illegally and gives them title to their land. So something like 90% of the people who were there illegally one day, the next day have title to the property that they've been living on. They just have to document that they're living there. And all of a sudden, all these radical guys battling the government are property owners. They suddenly turn into conservatives. They want law and order. They want protection of their property. <laughs> and the government spends money assisting with the infrastructure, the roads, and water, and things like that. From the government standpoint, these are taxpayers. The, the, the advantage the government has of turning illegal people to legal people is it can get taxes from them. That's not happy from, our, from a free market standpoint, but that's the benefit of government legalizing this. And so it just continues in this large in-migration 80% of these people had uh, titles, and then two-thirds of Istanbul by the late 80s were these migrants who came in from rural Istanbul. Um, it's amazing. The, the numbers on this, 500,000 migrants per year came to Istanbul from, the, from 84 to the end of the 1990s, turning into one of the largest cities in all of Europe. And it's an incredible success story. So the Turkish economy has moved to property rights, relatively clear property rights and market institutions, becomes the dynamo of the Middle East. So it's Turkish, Turkish firms that are rebuilding Iraq, that are rebuilding Libya, that are the major force in Egypt. These Turkish companies that have had a couple decades of economic growth and prosperity, plus, of course, lots of Turks went to Germany and earned money and experience there. So it's a positive force, but it's part of this migration into the cities, and the key issue is that you need to have legal systems. This is an article from The Atlantic about Iraq. What Iraq has is what Egypt has. It's, we spend all this money, effort, and lives in Iraq, and in Iraq it's almost impossible to start a business. If you're an everyday person want to start a business, it's day after day, it rakes 174th out of 183 on countries to start a business. And this is after, you know, Washington, D.C. has been running the place for, you know, a decade, right? So I guess it's sort of like Washington, D.C. But <laughs> in any case, it's, it's really, really hard and complicated. So in fact, it's, it's almost impossible to start a business. It's completely impossible to stop a business. No business has been legally closed in Iraq in over a decade because the government's got all these protections for workers. You know, if you close your business, you still have to pay the workers, you have to pay their training, you have to do this and that. So basically, when people try to shut down a business, they just have to wait <coughs> the day before payroll and take off. Because you, so who would start a business if you know you can't legally end it? So the, the importance, I would say, of economics and this topic is that if, how, I don't know how many news stories you've read about Iraq or Arab Spring or Egypt or the turmoil. The media says that it's all about purple thumbs. You know, the people vote and their thumbs turn purple, and, and that's great. Voting is the best way in the world to get rid of a bad government. It doesn't protect you from the next bad government, but it's a good thing. But the economic liberties are what's key. The people being able to run enterprises and grow, without that, you, you, you don't have the prosperity or growth you need. Okay. This is borderless economics. Is a, a, a story of these world migrations, and he argues what's different about the migrations of the last couple decades is people don't have to leave their old countries when they come to their new countries. I mean, you leave physically. If you've ever been to an inexpensive hotel in Texas, and I've been a lot of them, most of them are run by people from India or Pakistan. And if they're elderly people, they're, they're dressed in traditional garb, and their kids are working at various companies in Texas, if they're young people, they're always Skyping to India, working on some project on a company. When they have time, they check in. I mean, it's, it's incredibly dynamic, but the point is they're here in the U.S. working and living, and they're still back in their village or their, their city in India doing deals with their friends back and forth through Skype and the Internet. 
So for one of the so they're sending information and money back to friends. They're influencing the world through this immigration, and they're still networking together. So that the idea is the internet helps reduce the borders. And he talks about the the Chinese sea turtles or the you know all the Chinese reforms are basically people who've left China and came back. The innovation there, India, Bangalore, and all that is run by Indians from Silicon Valley who went back to India with their networks and their knowledge and helped build that industry and draw people into it. So it's a great story of how globalization is, is helping in the developing world. Arrival City, uh, Triumph of the City. Okay, oops, we've seen that one before. Yeah, I just wanted to mention the Liberty Fund uh, has a website with Again, if you have, don't have enough books to read, there's like 500 books on the Liberty Fund website that you can, you can read. Uh, but the discussion of Destute to Tracy, and he argues that society is sort of purely a series of exchanges. These continual exchanges between people sort of create the institutions. So that the, it's not the legal system that necessarily starts the exchanges, but the exchanges create the legal system through norms and, and it's sort of how he describes this. But you know from economics that people don't trade things of equal value. They trade, they, they trade things that, they get things that are more valuable to them. That is, value increases through trade. Cities are places of vast amounts of exchanges, so they're tremendous in creating wealth. This constant series of exchanges in cities are one of the reasons why there's so much wealth creation uh, in cities. And so, there's more on that. So, if we go back in time and look at this idea of cities and trade, if you go back to the ancient world, this is going to be the next part of my presentation, you have basically cities, trading cities, competing across the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Each city has got its unique institutions, political and economic institutions, products they're producing and exporting. And I know there's other stuff going on. You guys are writing plays in Athens and unimportant stuff like that. <laughs> but in terms of creating wealth and, and, and trade, you're, you have inexpensive shipping across the water, and you have tremendous economic growth in the ancient world, partly through these trading institutions, and each city has its own institutions. The way this is some, seems to be taught sometimes is that, the, like the ancient Greeks, they're always squabbled. You know, the ancient uh, Greek cities couldn't get together as one country until Alexander came through and conquered everybody. And this set as a sort of a problem that they didn't have a nation and only had cities. And I'm arguing that prosperity in the ancient world and the medieval world came from cities, not nations. Cities are the source of wealth. And if you're a farmer, farmers create wealth too. I'm not ne negating <laughs> agriculture, but cities are, are crucial in wealth creation and facilitating farmers, right? For any farmer to produce a surplus, he's got to have some place to trade it. Uh, some place to export. So I'm going to talk about Venice, Genoa, Hansa very briefly. I'm going to talk about medieval monasteries, which are like the first transnational corporations expanding uh, uh, trade and, and industrial development across Europe. I don't think they refer to themselves as transnational corporations, but still. <laughs> um, and the charter cities and the Hanseatic League. And I'm going to argue that the rise of, of markets and self-government <coughs> comes with these charter cities. And this is the argument that Richard Pipes is making. So one of the things about institutions, the ancient Greeks had institutions that came from their, uh, uh, their religion or the, the Greek uh, uh, from Homer and, and, and Hesiod, that uh, trade was sort of sacred. You were told by the gods to treat strangers well. You were supposed to provide someone a meal before you even asked their name. Right? So if you're in commerce and trade in the ancient world, and you have a choice to go to this, this city or village where they kill everybody who's a stranger, or they might, or to a bunch of Greeks who serve you dinner before you even ask who you are, you go to the Greeks first. You trade your goods. And so the argument is these trading institutions, the sacredness of trade and commerce, benefited Greek cities across the ancient world, and Phoenician cities as well. Trade is a discovery process, and these exchanges spread technology and innovation. So if you look at the ancient world, you've got these city-states. In Athens, let's say the population grows, so a bunch of Athenians uh, have been trading, let's say, through the Black Sea. And over centuries, they've been going to certain spots and trading with the natives there. And 
you know, the process continues and pretty soon there's a trading outpost there where people stay and then a whole, you know, 150 some number of people from the mother city go and form a colony. And the colony has similar legal institutions than the one it came from. So you have this competition from a dozen or 20 or 30 ancient cities of the cities of the ancient world that are each setting up daughter colonies based on their institutions. And if your institutions harm economic and political progress, um, then your, your trading outposts don't do as well as others. So there's, you know, this is federalism, ancient federalism, right? You have different people locally get to have a say in their government, as long as they're men and own property and whatever the other restrictions are. Uh, but that process in the ancient world are sort of charter cities, right? The cities have constitutions, they have charters that lay out the legal institutions. So if you look through the ancient world, um, the red, the red here are the Greek cities and the yellow are the Phoenicians. And they're just spread all around. They grow over time and prosperity grows as trade uh, increases through this time. And they're on water because it's you know, less expensive. Um, so you can see the you know, timbers from here, tin here, iron and silver come. The Etruscans I've been reading about are up, up in here someplace. They've, they've got all these raw materials that come out of the mountains there that they export. So there's specialization um, around the ancient world. And you know, wealth increases. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a productive process. Also, Hayek and others argue that there's entrepreneurship and property rights in trade. Because you know, if, if you're an emperor and you've got a guy that is a slave to you and you let him sail off in a boat with a, you know, $50,000 or $500,000 worth of goods, uh, it doesn't help to have a slave do that. They tend not to come back. So having someone who owns the good, has a stake in it, has incentives right, so institutions that allow entrepreneurship and responsibility that way are going to benefit as well. So these trade routes throughout Europe, the ancient world. Uh, and this is moving forward to medieval trade, and these are the trading routes of, of Venice uh, and Genoa down here, and across the top are the Hanseatic League. And again, these are, these are commercial routes, some overland routes, and there's goods and services being, being uh, traded around the world in you know, 1200, 1100, and through that time. So, again, it's cities. Cities are doing the trade, uh, leagues of cities, and they're competing with each other. There's, there's all sorts of institution arrangements but, uh, between them. Uh, it's not perfect, right? It's a long time ago, people aren't as wealthy as we are, but it's creating wealth and progress. Most people are in farming, you know, 90% of people, just because the, the wealth isn't, uh, there isn't enough wealth uh, for, you know, spare time and so forth. There's another process in this that uh, I think is interesting, and I'm just going to, these are uh, monasticertian monasteries in Eastern Europe. Uh, a huge role in economic development can, comes from the monasteries in, in 10, 11, 12, 1300s, and to, to tell a little bit of that story, uh, this is a, a book called The Medieval Machine about the first industrial revolution of Europe, which is a water power. This is before coal. The industries were powered by water. And so we have text of a, a one Cistercian monastery. Uh, machinery is central to European life. Uh, the community ran its own factory, used water power for crushing wheat, seeding flour, filling cloth, and tanning. And this is the 12th century. This story of the industry of this sort of corporate, and the, I mean, the, the, the people aren't doing this so they can make a lot of money. They're priests. They want time to prayer. But they have to provide for themselves. And they develop the technology to do it. And in this, and of course, they're providing these services for the farmers all around them and people producing other goods. But you could repeat this, the author says, 742 times, because that's how many Cistercian monasteries are through Europe. The ones, early ones in France, incredibly successful, so they start another monastery up the road 100 miles, and then another, and then they're spreading through Europe. And those are the Cistercian monasteries, uh, thousands of miles away, way running, running under similar institutions, like a, a branch of a corporation that knows how to make cars or, or some other product. I don't mean to demean the monasteries, but on the economic side of what they were doing, they were producing, creating wealth through their processes, and they had their Legal, island of legal institutions within the monastery. Their, their, their legal system was self-contained. So that's Cistercian monasteries. There were 37,000 Benedictine monasteries. 
every Benedictine, the author of this book that I'm drawing from, says every monastery was sort of an agricultural college for the whole region. Because the monastery comes in with the monks that have knowledge about agricultural products from where they came from. They're learning to adapt what they know to the local conditions. They're looking for new products uh, to create, to export to others. So uh, you have monasteries exporting wine. You have a whole range of things, monastery bond. So the trading network I showed earlier by the, the, the Venetians and the Genoa, the, the various cities, a lot of that is coming from the monasteries that are spreading uh, industrial production. And this is, this is early. This is you know, well before the Industrial Revolution. And it's not incredible progress by our standards, but it was significant economic progress and wealth creation and new technologies over the centuries. Um, I don't know how many of you have read Rodney Stark's work. Rodney Stark is a sociologist written on the rise of Christianity and sort of on the economic institutions. But he has a book called The Victory of Reason that looks at the um, economic development and knowledge and technology spreading up the west of uh, Europe uh, from the Italian uh, city-states. OK. So we're getting closer to the present. We're only eight centuries away, so we're almost there. Um, Hanseatic League is this incredible trading network through the north. And this is a, this is a story that ties into economic development today. Uh, so how many of you have heard of the Hanseatic League? I guess if you've taken a certain class that talks about it, uh, you should have. Uh, so it's, it's a, a league of cities, and it's sort of a voluntary network. And as you read about it, it's fascinating. There's a limited number of books about it. But basically, these are cities that had a charter from the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and through that charter, they were allowed to resist the control of the local prince, or some had made a deal with the local prince for their charter. Uh, but these historical institutions, this is an article in The Atlantic called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Ending Poverty. And it's about the work of Paul Romer at Stanford. Uh, Paul Romer is an economist who's called, he said, if you want economic <coughs> revolution development today, charter cities are the way to do it. So he's been pushing for charter cities in Honduras and other cities that are basically like Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a place incredibly poor in the 1950s. It becomes prosperous in just like three or four decades. It's like the wealthiest, freest place in the world, even though it's part of communist China, right? Singapore is a charter city. There's other charter cities. And, and, and so he tells the history here of uh, a Germanic prince, Henry the Lion, who's got a territory he just conquered and he wants to sort of keep it. He decides to set up a charter and allow uh, merchants who show up there to say, look, you, we will give you the right, light regulations and laws should inv uh, uh, attract investment. You escape the feudal hierarchy. And any merchant that comes there, you make your own laws. You, you run your own government. I just want 10%. It's like a sales tax, I guess. So merchants came from all over to Lubeck, this first Hanseatic League city. And then other cities uh, were developed after that. Now, you can, on chartercities.org, you can read Paul Romer's uh, work. He argues that sit, this is a picture from Africa of kids doing their homework uh, sitting by the street, because the street is the only place that has light at night. So if they want light for their homework, that's where they have to sit. And he's saying, this is crazy. These people have cell phones, but they don't have light. Cell phones come from the private sector, light from the government. Uh, so he says, if you want to fix that, you need a charter. That would be one way to do it. And he's pushed for this charter city in Honduras. And there's more to read on that website. Uh, you can read his article in the Atlantic. Globalenvision.org has had articles on, on charter cities. And there was recently a piece <coughs> on uh, Planet Money NPR uh, of a TED Talk. And this is, I think, the first Paul Romer TED Talk. And they really do a nice interview to tell the background of setting up the charter city on Honduras, which was approved by the legislature and then invalidated by the Supreme Court. So they're still doing a battle on it. But basically, a bunch of investors go to Honduran government and said, we'd like to rent, lease, a couple square miles of land for 99 years, just like they did in Hong Kong, and except that we'd like you to do it voluntarily. We don't have gunboats forcing you to do it. And we will take ownership of the land. We'll pay for it. We'll pay rent. And we would like to be able to build a port, build an airport, let factories set up here. 
Nobody in Honduras has to work there, but if people want to come and work, they're welcome to. So instead of trying to force institutions on the whole Honduran government, you're saying, we just want to carve out a bit of territory, lease it on a long-term basis, and operate it as a model that we know from around the world works, is in Hong Kong and Singapore and other cities. So that's sort of telling that story. Now, uh, there's an article in the paper about recent events. This is 2011 of a UK Nordic summit of northern cities uh, that have been responsible, that have you know, uh, cut taxes and cut expenses and run surpluses and promote free trade. And the media was upset that these cities are sort of anti-EU and anti, so the disasters in Europe are mostly the southern cities. And these northern cities, the article said, for the first time ever, these northern cities are getting together to form a league of cities, nations. And uh, my friend Leonard Liggio writes on this, that it isn't the first time. This is actually the Hanseatic League reforming. Mm. These are the same, the Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, are basically charter cities from the Hanseatic League, the city and the territory around it, and Denmark and elsewhere rejoining. London was, parts of London were part of this, and so he's describing this Hanseatic League effort. And I have the website if you want to read some of these articles. But the Northern League is very much the reformed the Hanseatic League. So the, the argument on this is not only wealth that's created in these charter cities through trade and commerce, but uh, at least Richard Pipes argues, and others do too, that in his book Property and Freedom, that our civil liberties, our, our economic liberties developed in these cities. The cities, like cities in the ancient uh, world, ancient Greece and Athens, were self-governed. Like in Novgorod, annually, all the citizens of the city got together in the assembly and would recite and decide on the laws, right? <coughs> it was, a, it was a, this sort of Greek model. And so there was a system of self-government. And that liberties, contracts for trade and commerce and running businesses and, and you know, legal systems and, and dispute, dispute resolution were decided by the legal institutions in the city. And those institutions, Pipes argued, influenced much later uh, John Locke and the others uh, writing about uh, uh, individual rights and liberties. And of course, there's strong religious background in all these as well. Um, so if you want to learn more about charter cities, I don't know how many of you have watched Rick Steves, The Travel Guide. He's got an episode you can see online. It's called Little Europe, Five Micro Countries, which is really five charter cities. Right, these are ones that are left over from ancient times as most of Europe nationalized into big nation states, a few cities were left over. Uh, Liechtenstein, uh, the, uh, the Vatican is sort of an independent city with its own laws, but also Andorra. Andorra is a place high enough in the mountains that the, basically the government troops, it was too expensive for them to go conquer these people, so they left them alone. And now being high in the mountains is good because you've got a ski resort there. <coughs> but it's an independent city state, or charter city, and it's got really low taxes, uh, good investments, so a lot of it's, it's popular for tourism, and you can find out about it on Rick Steves' uh, show. And this is the video plays on that, and yeah, these emphasizes the, the, the low taxes, people come from all over to shop. Um, so charter cities didn't just go away, there's bits and pieces of them left over. Around, and by the way, one of the Hanseatic League cities was one of the first to recognize the United States as an independent country. I've forgotten which charter city it was, but you've got sort of a United States tie in there it's as well. It's actually a Croatian one, Ragusa. Was it? Okay. It's now Dubrovnik. Okay, and was that a Hanseatic City? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's on the Adriatic. Uh, that's that's yeah. the story I've heard. Sure. But anyway, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other people from another country with another claim? No, <laughs> <laughs> no that's, yeah, so you uh, but, the, but the Hanseatic League, you know, the idea of colonies and federalism. Remember, the United States didn't form as an entire country so much as a number of colonies that were mostly self-organized and then only on international affairs that you have the federal government. So the self-governing, self-governing, self-judging uh, networks, these cities gained their freedom from the local uh, leaders. The male residents were part of these communal assemblies. Uh, urban residents, if you wanted to escape serfdom, how do you get out of serfdom in the Middle Ages? You escape to a city, you stay there a year and a day. Uh, city air makes free. If you're in a city for a year and a day, you, your lord has no claim on you anymore. So people went to cities. It was an attraction. 
So trade, manufacturing, and you had whole separate legal systems to handle what cities did. So they weren't in feudal law. They, they had their separate legal systems. And those hold on in the future. OK, we're just about uh, out of time. But uh, yeah, there's a scene in the recent Robin Hood movie that is nice on property rights, that the institution of owning your house, you know, the king of England can't come into it. And it's, it's sort of a fun short segment that's in the uh, that's in the uh, movie, which they don't, which seems to get taken off YouTube, so you have to buy the movie to watch that one 30 second scene. Uh, but these, uh, the concept of rule of law, that the law doesn't come, that the state doesn't make the laws, instead the state is considered legitimate that enforces the laws that already exist, right? Legitimacy in a country, the laws are there, this is Antigone and others, there's a higher law than the state, and those, that enforce that law, those leaders are just. If they don't enforce the law, it's time to get a new government. So according to Pipes, modern democracy originates in these medieval towns where private property and free enterprise protected the rule of law. The nation states blast away all this, destroy most of it, and so you only have little bits left of the, this earlier system. Uh, the 16th and 17th century age of ab absolutism, so the urban self-rule sort of disappears. But Pipes argues that these ideas uh, that the cities had fostered and institutions had created were an intrinsic <laughs> part of the Western polit political tradition. So he argues it's, it's important. And there's still a Hanseatic League. They met in Novgorod in uh, 2009, so you can find them online. It's not clear if they're trying to reestablish the League of uh, Hansa Cities, but I think that would be a good movie script for anybody who wants to uh, build a screenplay on that. Uh, I think it's more like a Chamber of Commerce connection for tourism and, and trade, but it's, 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 it's a part of history that's important. I was on my way to Europe to give a talk on this, and flying on Lufthansa, when I noticed Lufthansa, Air Hansa, the airline of the Hanseatic League. Um, <laughs> apparently better than Luftwaffe, which would have been the <laughs> for the German airline. Um, so anyway, I have information on this, economicthinking.org, charter cities, uh, some online materials, and there's, again, just great books and sort of a, it's a neat, different way to come at the story, I think, focusing on the independence uh, of cities and the wealth creation capacity of institutions in the cities. Okay, thank you. itself from China on its own, right? Communist China is right next door. So it was the British government behind it. So they knew that any incursion into Hong Kong would bring the British Navy, you know, sooner or later. So the big thing in the Charter Cities is arguing you need a sovereign power behind it, not just, uh, you know, some company, right? Because you can have a huge company, but the government can take everything. So that's why they, they want Canada or some other country to be sort of somehow linked to it. So in the case of the Honduran one, they had a network of four or five countries providing legal system and somehow security in this, and they thought that might work. I want to get a picture of the group, by the way. <laughs> just so I tell people that I wasn't just on my own. I was right here. One, two, three. Good, thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the bit of the story, and that's a, that's a big issue because really this, the Honduras doesn't want to grant sovereignty to a foreign country. You know, nationalism, people fight to the death for one square inch of their soil, right? So you, you try and set this up without having the nationalist in, in the problems, but they do currently have free trade zones, free enterprise zones all over the world. There's parts in Mexico and elsewhere where you can bring in products, manufacture them and export them, pay no taxes. There's huge factories, the whole... Uh, was it Maculador? Yeah, the, the range across southern the border with Mexico. 
Uh, you, you, so there's, there's that system to build on. So they're all are saying is we want to make that a little more, you know, add some more institutions to that is what they're trying to claim in the, the gradual ramp up to it. So, and uh, Gary was telling me that uh, they're planning one near here, right? What's the island? Yeah, on Belle Isle. Uh, uh, Rodney Lockwood has suggested uh, buying Belle Isle from the city of Detroit and uh, having it be a territory of the United States, so it's not part of Detroit any longer. But yeah. so he's he's had some major meetings and uh, with some pretty big political folks, and he's got a investors that he's put together. That yeah. Things he's going to try to do. Actually. Yeah. So there, yeah, is could you do that in the U.S. with an Indian reservation yeah. becoming a charter city or? part of empty Detroit or an island offshore that we've got like the Northern Mariana Islands or islands way off in the Pacific that are part of the United States. We have immigration laws, but they don't in the Northern Mariana Islands. People from China by the thousands come there and work because they have a waiver. They're not part of the formal United States with its immigration. They got a waiver, they got a waiver from the government, which um, Iowa has asked for. Iowa has less people than like a hundred years ago, right? So they've asked for a waiver from immigration restrictions. So. Of course, the immigrants come and they say, wait, I can't leave Iowa? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of places that would like more people. And uh, so for territories, you, you want to attract foreign capital. You want to have access to foreign institutions. And uh, so that's part of that. Yes? What's your opinion on blue seed and seasteading? Yeah, so the next step of this uh, you know, we've got these tremendous, significant restrictions on high-tech people coming into the country. I think our, our work visas for high-tech people were sold out in a day this year. And so all these high-tech companies in Silicon Valley want to bring people in. They can't get them in because they can't get permission from the government. So there's a company that's set up, is setting up a city off the coast of California. And it's only 13 miles off, I think is the number, maybe three. It's not as far as I would have thought. And they can bring anybody in the world there. Uh, so when they want to have a meeting with Silicon Valley executives, the executives fly out by helicopter and have the meeting in this office building in a boat with entrepreneurs from all over the world that are there trying to start companies and want access to Silicon Valley know-how and capital, but aren't legally allowed in the country. So that's one part of the story is the company that's raising money for doing that. And they've got something like that going on now, uh, but they're looking to expand it. And then there's the Seasteading Institute which is uh, uh, Patrick Fried Friedman, Milton Friedman's grandson. Milton Friedman was very free market, and each generation they get more free market. <laughs> so Patrick is like as free market as you can get, and he wants to set up cities out in the sea, the Seasteading Institute, where you basically buy a house on a boat, and you own it, or you use oil rig technology, and you build a city out at sea that's a completely free city, that's an Anseotic League-like city with its own institutions. And so they're trying to raise money for that. Uh, he's got, uh, uh, what's the guy from PayPal? Uh, Peter Thiel on board as an investor, which is always a good start when you get a, like a billionaire on board. So, but he's trying to promote the idea as well as the city. Uh, they've been trying that in New Hampshire. You know, the idea is if you get enough libertarians in New Hampshire, they'll vote for a libertarian government. Uh, and people who don't want a libertarian government will leave New Hampshire, but they don't have to go far. They just go to Vermont. <laughs> so, any other? You guys study the classics, so I hope I didn't do too much damage in my <laughs> romp through the ancient world. Uh, but, uh, I just am fascinated by the idea of these network of cities in the ancient world and all these. Uh, it's just a system amazing. So it does beg the question what kind of system of defense did these ancient cities have? So as they would plant little colonies around the Mediterranean, right? How could they, they couldn't just mobilize an army and yeah. be there in a week, right? It would take them probably longer than that uh, to do so. So how, how did these cities defend themselves? This ties into the topic of researching pirates because that's what they were dealing with, with trade around the ancient world. So, I mean, the Athenian League sort of gathers to, to, to stop pirates. Um, yeah, each city would have its own defense in various ways, and of course the merchant ships were armed uh, to the extent that there were pirates attacking them. They had to defend themselves. They'd go in, in groups, of, groups together and so forth. 
but it's it's obviously a problem. Of course, uh, but you know what 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 stories do we have? We have the Persians attacking big nation state and the city states unite to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So we have at least success stories for a time on that. With the Hanseatic League, you have amazing stories of the Hanseatic League, you know, hiring their own uh, police forces, uh, weaponizing some of their boats. Basically, they respond to whatever threats they think are there, and they've got very strong incentives to not pay too much or pay too little. So I think you've got a vast diversity of stories uh, over the centuries of how they uh, defended their trade routes. Um, has anybody read the book uh, The Walking Drum by Louis L'Amour? It's Ronald Reagan's favorite book. And it's a book of medieval ages about trading fairs and commerce through the ancient world. And the, the, the trading for the walking drum was what they beat as the whole merchant trading group overland would head to Russia here and there with all their goods. And the various lords and princes would, would come down with their troops and uh, try and attack them and they would defend themselves. And, and you know, they, they had as much defense as they needed to uh, deal with whatever threats uh, were coming their way until the Huns came or something and <laughs> wiped everybody out. Mm. But yeah, so I don't know enough about that. Of course, what that didn't stop me from addressing the question. <laughs> but I don't know enough about it. What about the Vikings up there is where the Hanseatic uh, League was? Yeah. The Vikings were quite destructive. Yeah, and I... the same era. That's right. I know that the, the Holland and the Netherlands became the uh, competitors for the Hanseatic League and, and were very successful. But I actually don't know the Viking story, the intersection with the Hanseatic League. Because you had princes there in, in Sweden and elsewhere all this time as well. So, uh, you know, it wasn't all the Hanseatic League, but they were uh, interconnected with this group. So, any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Mr. Rector.